Spending at the ink machine. Hello everyone, let's start! Yeah! <laughs> Dark Revival, huh? Sounds interesting. Benji and Dark Revival. Oh! oh, that hurt! Man, it's times like this that I wish I had an attack plunger. <laughs> You're supposed to throw it at my hand! Your head's a bigger target. Oh, I will show you a bigger target. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll show you a bigger target. <laughs> Oh gosh! Oh, I'll see that again. I'll see that again. He being hit again almost every time. Oh, that hurt! Man, it's times like this that I wish I had an attack plunger. Catch it! Catch it! You're supposed to throw it at my hand. Your head's a bigger target. Oh, I will show you a bigger target. <laughs> oh. Internet, welcome to Game Theory. Hello. Okay, so I have a confession to make. I've underestimated the Bendy series. I honestly think most of us have. So what do I mean by that? Well, from a storytelling standpoint, these games are a lot more sophisticated than you might first believe. Super sophisticated. So, 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 super sophisticated. Mm, that's right. <laughs> Take, for instance, my last episode on the game, where we covered the design detail of characters who melt away being creatures who are made entirely of ink versus those whose bodies persist after being killed. Those are the ones that are infused with real human souls. I mean, it's an extremely subtle detail in the game design, and at no point does the game actually spell it out for you. If they melt, they have no soul. But it's essential for understanding basically the entire plot of this game. Everything from how the ink machine works to the meaning of the ending. But for another great example, let's look at Sammy Lawrence, everyone's favorite music director slash cultist slash uh, part-time hot topic social media manager. He has <laughs> this dramatic death at the end of chapter two, so when he reappears at the top of chapter five, all of us were like, oh, what happened? Uh, cue the montage. Oh, okay. No, no, why? Are you kidding me? Sammy Lawrence? Wait, I'm really? It's Sammy. It's Sammy I Lawrence. He died. Oh, do we have to finally fight you? So. That's not Sammy, because Sammy died in chapter two, right? Gamers across YouTube were shooketh by this revelation, but if we were really paying attention, and I mean really paying attention to the details, we would have known that Sammy had actually been reborn one other time between those two chapters. Across Bendy's five chapters, there's actually only two sorts of candle assets that are used. One, that are candles inside of cans of bacon soup, and the other <laughs> ones are tall white candles. Now, the bacon soup candles are used practically everywhere, but these white ones only tend to be used in places that are associated with music. Remember Sammy Lawrence? Always oh, something like rituals. Sacrifice, right? Hmm. That's interesting, that's interesting. Is the music director, or places where Sammy physically is. In chapter two, for instance, they're around all the little prayer altars and sacrificial bowls that Sammy has set See, up. See, I knew it's sacrificial. Up for the ink demon. Again, in chapter five, there were Sammy and the Lost Ones have set up their little memorial wall. But they're concentrated in one other random place throughout the game, specifically chapter four's caves. At the top of chapter four, there's an ink pool that we have to unlock that contains a respawning swollen searcher. You are supposed to rip off his little ink wart on his shoulder and then we move on. We use it to create a gear, fix the the little hangy dangly bits and you the the mechanics, the the devices involved in, you know, physics stuff. 
move on to the rest of the game. It's a very simple puzzle. The pieces are right next to each other. It's not that complicated. But if we look closer at that moment, we'll actually notice more of Sammy's ritual candles set up around that inky pool with Sammy's iconic mask hidden on the ground just behind it. Sammy was here too, trying to summon something. The ink demon? We can't really know for sure. Maybe he was successful, which is why his mask is the only thing left there. Now, I didn't find this out myself. It was was actually put together by Tumblr user Dreamfisher, who, along with another Tumblr user Adobe OutDesign, are the two most prolific bendy theorists on the internet, as far as I know, at least. Their work has gotten me to start taking a closer look at this game again, which is perfect since there's actually a new game coming out later this year. More on that in a minute. PS4. Oh my god, that's nostalgic. Everybody was like, PS5. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about game design. It's mm -hmm. interesting, actually. As I've gone back through this game, I've really questioned why I missed some of these details the first time through. And the reason is that the game design has a lot of noise. And I don't mean noise like, wow, I'm at a party and it's so loud and I need to shout in order for anyone to hear anything that I'm saying. I mean that there's just a lot of details in this world that feel extraneous, whether or not they actually are. Let's take a look at it from a numbers perspective. Noisy data is basically a set of numbers with a large amount of additional meaningless information mixed in. So, True. hit me with the numbers. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So like here, right? You look at these data points and you can tell pretty quickly just by looking at it that it's supposed to be in the shape of a line, right? True. This is what's known as clean data. But now, let me open this up here. I haven't used one of these since like science fair in high school. But now, <laughs> if you... Yeah, science fair. Yeah, high school, secondary school. You look at this data, it's a lot less clear what this shape is meant to be. True. What's important in this data set? What isn't? Is there supposed to be a shape to define these data points at all? Probably not, quite honestly. All of this data is very noisy. Wow, the world of statistics is so exciting! What if I told you statistics can be fun? So now let's translate it to something that is legitimately exciting, video games. And compare it mm -hmm. to everyone's favorite franchise on this channel. Yeah. Five Nights at Freddy. <laughs> oh, favorites! Yeah, Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah. Oh, it invades even episodes that aren't about it. But there's a good reason in this case. Five Nights at Freddy's is actually a great example of this concept. FNAF isn't a noisy game series. True. The first game is so stripped down, in fact, that the meaningful data points just stand out right for you. Golden Freddy, phone guy calls, weird newspapers on the wall. That's it. That's all you really need to solve the plot of this thing. It that's, that's sort of true, that's sort of true. This, this, and this. Ta-da! FNAF 2, yeah. There's a lot more going on, more rooms, more animatronics, more gameplay, but stuff like the mandatory death minigames force the meaningful data points directly into your face. You know that they're important, even if you don't quite understand what they mean. It's up to you to figure out the line that connects those pieces. But in general, you know what data points you're working with. So now let's translate it over to Bendy. Now, I love Bendy as a game. I love its aesthetics, I love its characters, but it's a noisy game world. From a design standpoint alone, the walls are covered in lots of different messages. The messages themselves repeat multiple times across the five different chapters. They all tend to have the same handwriting, so it's unclear whether they're supposed to be tracked to different writers or the same writer. There's mysterious footprints all over the floors, doors open and shut seemingly at random, and there's just a lot of stuff everywhere. It's a messy, ruined world, and that's okay. That's part of the atmosphere, but it just makes it unclear what's intentional world building and what's just there to fill out the space. As a result, when I was crafting theories on Bendy, I tried to stay away from a lot of that messy data and just focus on the things that are clearly important in any game that you play, quite honestly. The audio logs, character designs, dialogue, and things like the ending or end chapter images. But even those, a lot of times in Bendy, would get changed when a new chapter released or when new updates would come out. And it does seem like as the game's gone on, more and more of it has gotten intentional, which is always a good thing. Anyway, the reason I bring all this up is because this game needs more theorists working on it. There's True. still a lot to unpack here. There's a lot of stuff to sift through, which is especially important because there's gonna be a new game, Bendy and the Dark Revival. Oh. Bendy, I and the Dark Revival and the Dark Revival. 
Already, there has been a lot of talk about this game playing into this new idea of choice based on this one line in the teaser. But one thing always remains, the choices you make. And aside from that one line, that's really all we have to go off of. You could say that what's really going on here is Bendy and the shots in the dark. Oh. Terrible joke. Anyway. Ooh, shots in the dark. Because then I guess we can, they, they, at that point in time, they still don't know much about it. So yeah, shots in the dark. Literally. All that being said, I actually think that we've been given more clues about this new game than we realize. So what is this new game about? And what is actually being revived here? That, my friends, is the question for today. First, oh. it's important to note that according to one of the game's creators, Mike Mood on Twitter, Bendy and the Dark Revival is not a sequel. Pew, there's the tweet right there. Pew. Looking at the evidence square in your face. And yes, Internet, I know that I put Bendy 2 in the title of this video, but guess what? Sometimes you gotta introduce people to a new game based on- Not a sequel, not a prequel, not a Bendy and the- uh, A Bendy and the Ink Machine 2. On, you know, traditional titling conventions. I'm trying to prevent another Kingdom Hearts here, friends. We're not gonna have ourselves Bendy's Ink Drop Distance, okay? But Mike, in that same tweet, also makes it very clear that this new game isn't a prequel either. So if it's not a sequel, and it's not a prequel, well, that only leaves us with two other possibilities. Either it's an alternate universe that's using Parable. the same characters in a new way, or it's a side story. And based on the evidence that we have leading up to this new game's reveal, I actually think it's gonna be a bit of both. Let me explain here. As we all know at this point, once you beat Bendy the first time through, you get yourself a chance to play through the game again, only this time you're using your lens of truth to see all the secret messages that are sprinkled across the walls and floors of Joey Drew Studios across the entire game, not just in the last chapter. And from the opening hallway, already things start getting weird. It becomes immediately clear that you're stuck in some sort of loop, as evidenced by the tally marks that you see along the right-hand wall. Add up those tally marks, though, and you get yourself 414. So apparently, 414. We've already gone through Joy Drew Studios 414 times. It seems like it's an arbitrary number, right? No. It's not. The teaser for the new game was officially uploaded onto the Joey Drew Studios YouTube channel on April 14th. 414. Oh. That's interesting. Hmm. That's not all. In the lead up to this big reveal of the new game, that same channel has been uploading audio logs from various moments throughout the studio's history. From those logs, you can actually construct a timeline of events. Bendy's premiere back in 1929, the studio growing in 1931, Alice Angel's premiere in 1932, the first appearance of the Butcher Gang in 1935, troubles with Bendyland in 1940, and the Ink Machine going in and really taking over the studio in 1943. But then okay. there's this one final audio recording. One that combines all the audio of everything that came before, but then introduces us to a whole new voice. So what can you expect in the coming months? You never know. He's always watching me. How very interesting. Such knowledge. The listed date of that recording? April 14th. Questionable year. 414 again. So very clearly the game's developers are setting up a connection between the time loop that Henry finds himself trapped in and this new character who's researching the ink machine and the people who were connected to it to uncover the secrets behind the studio. This also isn't the first time that we're hearing about whoever this mysterious observer is. Before <laughs> chapter 5 was released, a series of three audio recordings were uploaded onto that channel, each one labeled question mark, question mark, question mark. Remember, at this point in the story Henry has just met perfect Alice and Angel in Cyborus and was being held their prisoner, which is where chapter 5 begins. These audio recordings were made by Henry during that imprisonment phase. If anyone finds this, my name is Henry, and I'm trapped far below Joey Drew Studios. And while most of what he says across the other clips isn't particularly interesting, no offense, Henry. I know you had nothing better to do. You were stuck in an underground prison in an imaginary ink world made... It's not that all these are in the game in the fictional world, so mm, yeah. Who knows? He does make one odd comment that bears repeating here. There's crazy things happening down here. Monsters, demons, angels. But there's more. There's a secret hiding in the shadows. I just feel like I'm being watched. 
there's something at work here. Demons and angels are clearly references to Bendy and Alice. So what is this other thing? This thing that's listening to him? How is he being watched? It seems very clear that his fears in this audio recording are actually setting up and connected to this new observing character. So who is this person? Well, in the aftermath of the teaser's release, some people online have speculated that it might be Bendy himself, learning Ooh. to talk or something like that, but I would disagree with that conclusion. You see, on the official Bendy Twitter account for the last two months, they've been tweeting out a letter a day leading up to this reveal. If you put those letters together, like a grand old game of Wheel of Fortune, we get ourselves this message. Benevolent demon, someone has reawakened the dark. Someone has reawakened the dark. Hmm. Ooh, what is the dark? The fact that this phrase is being directed at Bendy and references someone else doing this reawakening indicates that Bendy probably isn't the one in question here. Taking it another step further, the phrase benevolent demon seems to be coming from Sammy Lawrence. He's the only one who not only sees Bendy as a force for good, but also speaks in this sort of biblical heightened language. For our Lord is calling to us, my little sheep. The time of sacrifice is at hand. However, think back to the first game. Over the course of Henry's story, we see Sammy go from being a devotee of Bendy, but the believers must honor their savior, to being completely disillusioned with Bendy. It's which, can you blame the guy? I mean, he just keeps getting killed at the hands of the god that he was just making sacrifices to. So the fact that he's back to calling Bendy a benevolent demon seems to indicate that this actually might be a Sammy from an earlier part of the timeline. Or, oh. should I say, an earlier part of the story loop. A time before he gets fed up with Lord Bendy ignoring his sacrifices of candles and bowls of soup. Also notice in this phrase that he's using the word reawakened the dark which would imply that the dark has been awake before. If the dark is in fact ink, then the ink machine is probably coming to life again after years of being turned off. Lastly, let's talk about this final shot of the teaser, the one that bludgeoned me to death at the top of this episode. The jump scare here definitely goes quickly, but if you slow it down and you brighten it up a little bit, the figure actually takes the shape of the Piper, one of the three members of the Butcher Gang. You'll notice the oh. ear, the hairline, that elongated face right there. Now, the Butcher Gang, to me, might be one of the most interesting unsolved mysteries from the original game. I mean, they're treated just like a normal enemy spawn, but stop and actually look at these guys. These creatures have clearly been twisted and tortured, their bodies mutilated and dismembered, and then reassembled together. Every other character in this game is either like an ink blob or some version of an existing cartoon character. But these three have been remixed in mutilated ways with body parts that have been removed and added. Ouch. Gosh. And heads and ears swapped positions, mouths sewn shut. And again, while this might just be noisy data, just some really cool, creepy designs for these characters, I don't think that's the case. There is clearly a backstory to these three particular characters, and that's proven by looking at the design of the Fisher. You see that? Fisher. He says right on his belt, liar. liar a sign that is written in and branded in that he's a liar. That's not a fashion accessory that you're walking around with their friends. Clearly, this isn't just an imperfection of the ink process. They're being punished for something that they did when they were human. And let's be clear, even though they do spawn a bunch of times throughout the game, they were human at one point, or at least a subset of them were. Well, yes, subset. many of them do melt back into the ink when they're beaten. Many of them don't, as evidenced by Alice Angel's little morgue here in chapter three. These guys are dead, but their bodies have remained intact, which means that oh. at one point in time, they did in fact possess a human soul. The other interesting thing about the Butcher Gang being the big climax to this teaser trailer is that they're on the side of Bendy. Think back to chapter three one more time. One of the tasks that Alice Angel gives us is defending her against an attacking onslaught of Butcher Gang members. That battle of allegiances is further supported by that chapter's ending. Remember, this was the one and only part of the original game that had an actual decision point involved. You could either go the demon route 
or the angel route. It literally changed nothing about how the chapter played out except for the final image that you were shown at the end of the chapter with the demon route showing you a particularly interesting one. It showed you Bendy leading the charge of an army of searchers and butcher gang members. Oh my God. They're aligned. They are on the same team. And so now let's look back at this new game's teaser one more time and how it mentions choice. It specifically says that we can walk with angels or cower before demons. Cower before demons or walk with angels. Ladies and gentlemen, we are picking sides. So putting all of this evidence together, here is my prediction for this new game. Whoever this observer is, he's reactivating the ink machine, probably the one that's currently laying dormant in Joey Drew's house. In doing so, it has the potential to change the course of Henry's story. This isn't a prequel or a sequel, it's yet another iteration of that gameplay loop, the 414th iteration of that loop, except this time, things might change based on our decision based on who we decide to align with, the path of the demon or the path of the angel. And that in turn will dictate how this whole loop plays out. And along the way, hopefully, we learn just a little bit more about these butcher gang members. Who knows, maybe we'll learn who that Tommy gun belonged to. And perhaps in the end, we'll finally be able to escape the ink reels once and for all. But hey, that's just a the- Bendy and the ink machine. Theory, a game theory. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Me disappear into a puddle of ink. Make it happen, oh. editors. No, no, no. <laughs> the editor just said, mm, yeah, yeah, he's trash. So just, psh, psh. <laughs> just from here, then pew, downwards. Did I do it? Did I disappear into a puddle of ink? <laughs> Jump into the garbage can. can. It's like the opposite. It's like the opposite of Hey Vsauce. <laughs> Alright, thank you so much for watching this video. If you do like this video, please consider to like, share, subscribe to my channel, and comment down below if you feel like you should. remember to follow my channel as well. So it's like, share, subscribe, comment, follow. Thank you so much. If you do like this video, um, they are just directed to okay. They are from the YouTube channel, The Game Theorists. This video is from the is from 2019, so it's around two years ago. And yeah, I do highly recommend that you watch their videos as well. Their works are amazing to watch. Very educational and very thought-provoking. Just make you think a lot. So yeah, thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching.